Okay, so our next speaker is Bartek, who was a postdoc of Stevens from 2007 and then followed him into one of his many startups and is now at Google. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so I'm going to talk about load balancing at Google, uh, which is really work that has a lineage all the way back to the TCP control uh, work that uh, basically uh, Stephen and I worked on. Uh, and um, you'll see a lot of similarities. There's a lot of things I can't say, which is I'm going to be biting my tongue through this talk, but I'm going to try to share as much as I can. Um, Um, so, this is sort of a basic setup of load balancing in a typical production system at Google. Uh, the yellow square is basically a user query coming into Google infrastructure. And it ends up landing in one of the front ends that we have. And then there's something called the global load balancing system, which essentially has a assignment of where, in what proportion queries should go where, in, uh, to which data centers. So the cells are, so are data centers, and there could be dozens of them around the world. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, within each data center, there's another load balancing layer, which is uh, basically to try to pick for a particular task that the query is going to get served on. So usually, when a query lands in a data center, it'll go through some sort of load balancer process which will then select a particular server that will deal with that query. Um, now, so uh, I'm working now in a Google research group that's basically trying to uh, reimagine how this whole stack works end to end. Uh, and so we're using sort of optimization and control to try to think about the whole system end to end. Um, and so there's, there's a, you know, a deep connection to this sort of TCP work that um, you're all familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of the details there, so I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> this is where I'm going to disappoint you. I, I bait and switch. I'm going to zoom in on one particular element that we actually published um, and uh, go into a lot of details there. But I just want to say that I hope Stephen is happy when he sees once we publish at work. That's sort of my guiding principle. Will Stephen be happy if... When he, when, he see, when he sees what, what we've been up to. So, so um, this, the work that I'm going to talk about is basically in the cell, how when a query comes in, it gets assigned to a particular server. And the external name we gave it, this is one particular algorithm we came up with, and we called it prequel. Uh, it's a collaboration uh, between uh, people at Google uh, and also uh, Robert Klein, Bobby Kleinberg from Cornell, who visited us for a year. So he was a faculty, visiting faculty in, in the research group. And uh, Stephen uh, Rumble is uh, YouTube. That's where we deployed it. And uh, Aaron Archer is actually my manager. <clears throat> so, uh, as I was saying, uh, the problem we're looking at is a query arrives in a cell, it lands on one of the client balancer tasks, and each task has to make a decision about which server the query should be served on. And really, the idea is to minimize latency. That's really ultimately what we care about. There are other constraints. For instance, we don't want to overload a particular task if, because if queries uh, don't not only take up compute, but they may also take up other resources like RAM. So we don't want to, if a particular task is very fast, we don't want to um, essentially uh, run out of memory on that task. So the, really the, at the core of the idea of this algorithm is uh, the power of D choices paradigm. So you probably familiar if you have N buckets and N balls, if you just place them randomly, um, <clears throat> uh, you get uh, log D maximum uh, log N number of uh, ma maximum balls in a, in, a, in a bin. But if you if you have the opportunity to, to randomly select two buckets and pick the bucket with um, the least amount of balls in it, every time you assign, you get log log D uh, in terms of the maximum number of uh, balls in a in a bin. And so, really, we want to use that like 
huge improvement to make our allocations when, we, when a query comes and gets assigned to the server. So what we do is every time a query comes, we, we'd like to probe the servers, a random subset of servers, and make an assignment. Uh, however, you don't want to actually, when a query comes, you don't, you don't want to wait for the probes to, to be sent and, uh, and a reply received, because that would add additional latency to the query. So really, a lot of the development here is how to do the probes asynchronously so that you're not waiting for them. Um, so what happens, the, basic of the basis of the algorithm is that uh, there is a background process continuously probing the servers, and there's a pool of available probes. When a query comes in, you make a selection assignment decision for uh, which server to choose based on the probes in the pool. Now, there's all sorts of optimization problems around how, how long do you keep the probes around for? Do you reuse them? Um, how, and this is something that Bobby spent some time thinking about, was, well, if you're continuously making the same selections using the same set of probes, is there some sort of bias in, in the probes that are left behind because you're using the best ones, so you're le leaving the worst probes in the pool? So you, do you still get the power of D choice guarantees and so on. So you know, we looked at that, those kinds of problems. And it turns out, yes, you can still, you can, you can resample from the same pool as long as you uh, regularly remove the worst probes from a pool, the ones that you haven't chosen. So you don't, pull, you're just leaving a polluted uh, pool of probes. Um, so how we can deploy this algorithm is either from one process to another, or if, another, if a process wants to talk to uh, a server, but the client is far away, we'd, we'd put a balancer that is close to the server so the probes can be, have low latency. Um, and you can deploy it, uh, sort of the third diagram is, you can deploy it in a complicated system at, in different parts of the system. And that's sort of a typical setup where we, we have um, a service such as YouTube that has many different backends uh, talking to each other, and you may deploy it in some critical ones. <clears throat> uh, so what kind of feedback does the server give us? Uh, it's some pretty sim simple signals. Uh, it basically maintains how many requests in flight it has, and uh, it, it tries to build up this estimate of latency for a particular, at, at, over, as a function of load. So, so it's, the, it's basically a function of what would the latency of a query be at a given request and flight level? And so the, the server, every time a query arrives, it's essentially incrementing this uh, request and flight counter. When a query leaves, it dec decrements it, but it also measures the start and finish time of a query and puts, updates the estimate for latency uh, for that function at that, at that level of request and flight. And the <clears throat> way the client decides which server to send to is um, has this pool of probes that's just being regenerated all the time. And we do this hot cold lexicographic selection. We classify servers into hot and cold uh, to allow us to basically satisfy two objectives. One of them is uh, try to limit the maximum number of requests on any server in order not to blow up the memory but also try to minimize, try to select the servers that are fast. And so what we do is we um, <clears throat> essentially uh, have some sort of threshold, how many requests in flight constitutes being hot versus cold. And servers that have more, more than those, that threshold amount of requests, we just call them hot. And in the first phase, we don't select from them. We only select from cold servers. And then we select the server that has the lowest estimated latency. However, if <clears throat> all servers that we happen to have in the pool are hot, then we just select the one with the uh, lowest request in flight so that we limit the... So this is going sort of back to the uh, power of D choices. We, we will try to limit sending to the worst one. Uh, now, so this is what happens when you uh, <clears throat> deploy it. So this, this is uh, a before and a after picture of deploying this algorithm to YouTube. Uh, YouTube homepage. Um, 
unfortunately, this graph is a bit of a travesty uh, because we couldn't release the actual latency numbers, so we had to normalize it in such a weird way that the percentiles interleave with each other. <laughs> so each latency is normalized against itself. So don't try to compare the numbers, just the before and after. <laughs> <laughs> This is what happens when you <coughs> work for a company. You can't actually <laughs> talk uh, about real numbers. Uh, anyhow, you can see things got better after we deployed it. The, the competitor was what was released before, what was running beforehand, which is weighted round robin, uh, which is essentially uh, the weights round robin where the weights are driven as to equalize CPU load. Uh, so the different percentiles, so P latency, P99 latency, P50 latency, uh, and there's the before is the weighted round robin and after is our algorithm. Uh, yes, so that's a, that's, that, that is the travesty uh, because we uh, can't share the absolute latency numbers, so we had to take, uh, we had to normalize the number against itself, sort of, and so don't, compare the relative number across the percentiles. Um, so um, this is uh, basically looking at the CPU utilization. So you can see we really tighten the um, uh, tails of CPU utilization, which matters because that means we can provision less CPU saves resources. Uh, we tighten the amount of requests and flight on servers, which also has impact on memory. We don't have to have as much memory to run the service. Um, this is the same story where in the memory tightening. Um, now I'm going to go a little bit deeper into, depending on how much time I'm left with, five minutes, great. Um, so uh, just to like dig in on some of the results, we have a test bed, 100, mach 100 machines, uh, and what it's basically running on Borg, which is our like, cloud system. And each machine runs many different jobs. So we have our server job, as well as some other processes we call antagonists running in the background. So some machines are overall harder than other ones. And some machines have spare capacity. Um, and <clears throat> this experiment basically increases the load of uh, so, so the, our, the, our server job has a certain allocation of CPU, and over the course of the experiment, we increase the load from 75% of the allocation to going up to equal to the allocation and even exceeding it. And you can see um, what happens is that the weight of round robin is, as, weight of round robin is here in the gray area, and so we just do sort of A and B uh, experiment as we increase the load. Uh, at some point, when around Roman basically uh, falls, falls over and the latencies blow up, whereas uh, the prequel algorithm just is pretty robust even if we exceed the allocation because it's able to reposition the load from the uh, tightly loaded machines to the ones that have spare capacity beyond your allocation. Um, and the reason this happens is you can see Weighted Van Roman is very focused. It's, this is a problem of choosing the wrong objective, objective functions. The objective function of Weighted Van Roman is to equalize the CPU load between machines, and it's doing that very well. You can see the distribution is very tight for CPU. But what that means is, it's, as, as the load on the machine goes up, it, even, though, even though that machine is uh, running out of capacity, it keeps on trying to put extra load over as you increase the load of that process rather than reallocating it somewhere else. And so that's why uh, it, it'll start getting errors and high latency on some machines. Whereas we, we basically just struggle and reallocate the load somewhere else. So our CPU distribution is not very tight, but the latency performance is, is very good. So the, you know, this is minimized latency and this is, and this is equalized CPU, different, different objectives and you get a very different performance. Uh, and we ran against a whole bunch of other competitors that are out there in various load balances and uh, 
you can see we did pretty well on 90%. If you run at 90% utilization, and this is, this is the latency um, at, at 90 percentile, 99 percentile. Uh, yeah, any questions? Sean. So, so when you send the user to one of the front end uh, servers, is there load balancing decisions involved in there, or you just randomly select one region? Oh, yeah, that, that's mostly like a DNS getting it to a particular regional front end, yeah. But there may be load balancing decisions. There may, there may well be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Patrick for the time.